Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you this morning. It's been a wonderful day of worship. It's always a privilege to be together on the first day of the week to worship God and to encourage each other. I'm so happy to see all of you this morning. Happy to have guests here. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope you'll study with us if you're visiting with our church family. In fact, as we begin our study, I'm going to ask you to get out your Bible, please, and make your way to the Gospel of Luke. Brother Brian began his lesson this morning by taking us to Luke, and I want to ask you to do the same. I want to go to Luke chapter 11. Please go in your Bible to Luke, the 11th chapter. We're going to read some verses from Luke chapter 11 in just a moment. You know, back in early January of this, of this year, in preparation for our trip to Canada in mid-March, we first had to make a trip to Mesa. We had to go to Mesa. Had to go to Mesa to the post office in order to apply for passports. You see, while I do have a passport because I've been able to go out of the country a few times, my family has not. They've never been out of the country, didn't have any passports, and so on a Tuesday morning, back in early January, we made our way to the post office in Mesa, and we filled out all the paperwork, and they got their pictures taken, and, and they applied for their passports, and all that went fine and well, but when the first week of March rolled around, and those passports still hadn't arrived yet, well, let me just say I started to get a little nervous. I started to squirm. I started to panic a little bit because our trip was only a couple of weeks away. And so after trying to find out the status of our passports online, and, and we had no luck with that, Janice and I decided to, to pick up the phone. We picked up our phones and we made some calls. We called the National Passport Information Center. In fact, we called that center over and over and over and over again. And every time we did that, you know what we got? We got a recorded message. We got a pre-recorded message telling us that because of the high call volume, we would not be able to speak to a representative. In fact, it would actually take us calling, calling this center for about three or four days until we finally got a representative on the phone. And once we finally were able to talk to somebody, you know what he said to us? He said, I can't help you. <laughs> he said, I can't give you any information. He said, I can't give you the status of your passport applications. And so keep checking online. And so after all that effort to talk to somebody for three or four days, we didn't get any of our questions answered, and thankfully, this story does end well. Thankfully, those passports did show up. They actually showed up just two days before our trip. I mean, we made it barely. They were going to be standing in one place, and I was going to be standing across the border, but we didn't have to do that. They got their own time, but let me just ask you this. Has it ever happened to you before? Has anything like that ever happened to you before? Have you ever in your life had a difficult time trying to talk to somebody? Have you ever in your life had a difficult time trying to communicate and connect with somebody? You ever found yourself having to wait for, for several days or several weeks or maybe even several months to be able to talk to somebody that you needed to talk to directly? That ever happened to you before if it has? And I believe we've all kind of gone through stuff like that before. Hopefully, what we find here in Luke chapter 11 is going to encourage us. And so in Luke, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse number one, in Luke 11 and verse one, the Bible says this. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. That is, as John the Baptist that we talked about this morning, like John the Baptist taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray. You say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now, there are a couple of very important observations that I want us to notice 
from these verses. First, in verse number one, notice how even though he had an extremely busy schedule, even though he is traveling from place to place by foot for the most part, doesn't have a car, doesn't have a bike or a scooter or even a skateboard. No, Jesus is going from place to place by foot and he's preaching all day and he's teaching the word of God. And he has all these people around him trying to get a piece of him, trying to get him to heal them or heal a member of their family. He's doing miracles all day and he's also getting into these contentious debates with the religious leaders of that time, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And don't forget, he's also got to train those apostles, right? Got to deal with their spiritual immaturity. Got to help them grow. Got to help them understand the nature of the Messiah in the kingdom of God. He's got to prepare them for the work he wants them to do when he is gone, even though Jesus has so much to do on a daily basis. He still carves out time for prayer. As the sinless son of God, he is still making time to have quiet moments with God. In fact, notice how while making time for a quiet moment with God, while praying on this occasion, after he is finished, his disciples come to him and they ask him to teach them to do the same. They, they ask him to teach them how to pray. They ask him to teach them how to talk to God. And notice what Jesus doesn't say to them in response. Notice how Jesus doesn't say to them, talk to God. Are you kidding me? Are you joking right now? Do you really think you really think you're going to be able to do that? Do you really believe that God wants to hear from sinful people like you? You, you really think that with all the stuff going on in the world right now and with all the stuff going on in the Roman Empire, that God has time for you. You really believe you're going to be able to break through that high call volume. You really believe that you're so important that the creator of the universe is actually going to make time to consider anything you have to say. Notice how Jesus does not respond to their request with any of those things. Instead, he responds by teaching them. By teaching them how to pray and by extension, also teaching us how to pray, teaching me how to pray, teaching you how to pray. And every now and then, brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded of how to pray. We need to be taught again how to pray. We need to make sure that our prayers have not become dull and stale and thoughtless and careless and full of, of mindless cliches. We need to make sure that we're taking full advantage of this amazing privilege we've been given from God to be able to talk to him at any time we desire. And so will you do that with me this morning? Will you learn with me this morning how to pray? Will you learn with me from Jesus how to pray? Will you allow Jesus to teach us how to pray and how to talk to our, our God and how to take full advantage of this amazing privilege that we've been given as the people of God? In fact, how about we do this? How about we learn from Jesus how to pray by considering the model prayer? The model prayer for disciples is found in Matthew chapter six. Will you go in your Bible now and just kind of park yourself in Matthew, the sixth chapter? That's where we're going to be for the rest of our lesson. Many of you know that in Matthew five, six and seven, we find the greatest sermon ever preached. The greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever walked on this earth. Jesus Christ. Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's a sermon about discipleship. It's a sermon about having the heart of a disciple. And in that sermon, he teaches us how to pray. He talks about prayer in verses 9 through 15. He teaches us how to do that. And we're going to read those verses. But before we do that, I think it's important that we understand something. I think it's important that we understand that what we find in those verses is a contrast. It's a contrast. It's a contrast to what Brother Stan read for us in the scripture reading this morning. Going back to verses 1 through 8, 
Jesus, if you remember in our scripture reading this morning, in those verses, Jesus talks about how not to pray. He talks about how not to talk to God. He talks about prayers that don't please God. Jesus says that prayers that don't please and glorify God are those that are done in hypocrisy and to be seen and noticed by men. They are those that are done merely to appear holy and, and righteous before men. They are prayers that are done mindlessly. They are full of mindless repetition and they're focused more on self than they are on God. Jesus says in verse number eight, don't pray like that. Don't pray like that. Don't follow the example of anybody you read about in the Bible who prays like that. Instead of praying like that, in verse 9, Jesus says, pray like this. Pray like me. Pray like I'm teaching you to pray. Include these things in your prayers. In verse number 9, Jesus says in Matthew 6, pray then in this way. You want to know how to pray? Jesus says, listen to me. Follow me. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, before we really start breaking down what the Lord says there in that prayer, and notice, that's a short prayer. That prayer doesn't go on and on and on. That prayer is not the kind of prayer where Jesus seems to think that to be approved before God, I got to pray for 10 minutes. That's not the kind of prayer that is, and yet, are any of us going to say that's not the best prayer in the Bible? That's the best prayer. And it's short, to the point, and rich. And let's notice what, let's notice some things about it. First, let me say this. Let me say that what we find in this prayer is not intended to be something that we just mindlessly recite. It is not intended to be something that if we don't memorize it and say it verbatim, then God is not going to be pleased with our prayers. It is not intended to be the only way we can pray or the only way we can talk to God. You and I both know that throughout the Bible, we find many examples and many different ways of God's people talking to him through prayer. Instead, what this prayer is intended to be is intended to be a model. It's a model. It is an example. It is spoken by the Lord to show us how to pray, to show us how to talk to God in such a way that is spiritually rich and glorifies his name. And so according to Jesus, where do we need to start? When we pray, what is the first thing that we need to do? What is the first thing that Jesus does? Well, notice how Jesus begins this prayer by acknowledging God. He acknowledges the greatness of the one that we have the privilege of speaking to. Look back at verse 9 again. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven. Notice how when talking to God through prayer, one of the ways in which we can address him is we can address him as Father. We can call God Father. We're not limited to calling him God or king or creator or supreme ruler or the great I am. No, Jesus says that we can actually call God father. We need to understand that, that was a radical idea to the people who originally heard Jesus say that. That was a radical idea to the Jewish way of thinking at that time. You see, while most of the Jews did think and view God as the father of their nation, the nation of Israel, and there are many passages to back that up, for the most part, the Jews did not see and view God as a father to them on an individual level. 
For the most part, they didn't see and view God as someone they could have an intimate and close personal relationship with. They didn't view God as a father on an intimate and personal level. And yet Jesus says here that that's exactly how we can see God when we pray. That's exactly how we can view God. That's exactly how we can think of God. In addition to being our king and being our creator and being our sustainer and our redeemer and our supreme ruler, Jesus says that when we pray, we can see God, we can think of God as our father, as our heavenly father. In fact, over 40 times in the gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus refers to God as father. And Jesus says we can do the same thing. We can call God what he called God. We can call him our father. But not only does Jesus say that we can pray and say the words, our father, who is in heaven. He also says that when we pray, we need to hollow the name of God. He says, our father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. This word hollow that Jesus uses here comes from a Greek word that means to consecrate to consecrate, to make holy. It is a word that urges us to do more than just speak God's name with reverence and respect, but to also speak his name, understanding who he is. Understanding his greatness, understanding his character and his nature. You see, God's name, whether you want to call him God or Jehovah or Yahweh, it reflects who he is. It reflects his nature. It reflects his character. It reflects his sacredness and his greatness and his holiness. It it reflects what he is all about. And when we pray, we should hollow the name of God. That is, we should pray that we and all people will acknowledge God. We should pray that we and all people will show God the honor and the respect that his name reveals that he is due. We shall pray that we and all people will come to know God and exalt God and obey God and submit to God because he is God, because he's the creator, he's the sustainer, he is the self-existent one who rules the universe. Jesus says that, that when we pray, we need to begin with God before going through our list of everything we want God to do for us, before going through our list of sick people and asking God for a promotion on our job or for a spouse or for some kids or any other requests we have, we need to pause and acknowledge with our mouths who we have the privilege of even talking to. We need to pause and acknowledge that we're not just talking to anybody right now. We're not just talking to our homeboy or our homegirl, just some person we met up the street. No, we're talking to, we're talking to someone of the utmost importance. We're talking to someone who created and sustains the entire universe. We're talking to our heavenly father. We're talking to the one who dwells in heaven. We're talking to the one who is perfectly holy and righteous and he knows all, sees all, loves all, and has provided a way for salvation for all through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says that when we pray, we need to acknowledge the greatness of God. And not only do we need to do that, He also says we need to pray for God's will. The will of God. Look at verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you a question. Do you pray for that? Do you pray for that? Do you pray for what Jesus talks about in that verse? I can understand if you struggle to pray for that. I, I, I get that. I can understand if you struggle to pray for that because usually whenever we see the word kingdom, 
in the New Testament, we immediately think about the church. We think about the church. We say, I shouldn't have to pray thy kingdom come or your kingdom come because it's already came. The church has already been established. The church was established back in Acts chapter 2 when those 3,000 people believed the gospel and repented and were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. I can understand, brothers and sisters, if you struggle to pray what Jesus is talking about here based on those things which are certainly true. But can I ask you to consider something else also, please? Can I ask you to consider how while the words kingdom and church are often used synonymously in the Bible, more often is the case that the word kingdom is not being limited to the church, but it's being used to refer to the rule and reign of God. The rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 6.33. Drop down to verse 33. Jesus says so in the same context, the same sermon. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first, here it is, his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. When Jesus says seek first his kingdom there, he's not talking about seek first the church. That's not what the Lord is saying there. He's talking about seeking first the rule and reign of God, seeking to make God your king. Every kingdom has a king. That's what Jesus is talking about there. And then look at Luke, please. Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, and in verse number 20, in Luke 17, 20, the Bible says, now having been questioned by the Pharisees, as to when the kingdom of God was coming. The Pharisees want to know, when is the kingdom of God coming? And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's right here among you right now. Some translations say it's even within you. You see how Jesus used the word kingdom? He doesn't limit the word kingdom to the church. Instead, he uses the word in these verses and so many others to refer to the rule and reign of God. He is saying that becoming part of the kingdom of God involves submitting to the king. It involves submitting to him as the king of kings and lord of lords it involves choosing to allow him to rule and reign over you completely in your life and while that rule of jesus certainly did begin on pentecost in acts 2 there's no doubt about that while his rule certainly did begin with those three thousand people who repented of their sins and they were baptized and added to his church i submit to though that even today we should be praying that more and more people will do that. Even today, we should be praying that more and more people will humble themselves to the rule of the king. That more and more people are added to the church of the king. That more and more people will submit to Jesus as the king and allow him to govern and guide and have first place in their hearts. In fact, Jesus will further emphasize that. And the second part of verse number 10, when he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, in order for people to allow Jesus to be their king, then they have to be willing to submit to, to the will of God. They got to be willing to do the will of God, just like those in heaven are committed to doing the will of God. If you remember, going back to Gethsemane, and Brother Chuck talked about that in his Lord's Supper remarks this morning. Jesus actually prayed for that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, when praying to his father, he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me, yet not my will be done, but, but your will be done. We got to pray for the will of God. We got to acknowledge God and pray for God's will. Pray that more and more people will submit to the king and become part of his kingdom. 
But he doesn't stop there because in addition to telling us to acknowledge God and pray for the will of God, Jesus also says we need to pray for our needs. Our needs. What are our needs? Well, according to verse 11, one of our needs is bread. It's bread. When Jesus talks about bread there, he's talking about the kind of bread you ate for breakfast this morning. He's talking about the kind of bread you're going to eat for lunch in a, in a few minutes. He's talking about food. He's talking about physical food that we need to live on a physical planet. He's talking about the food that we need to eat so that we can have the strength we need to have to do his will and to serve the people we need to serve. Jesus says we need to pray. Asking God for bread and notice how often we're supposed to be doing that. Notice how Jesus says we're supposed to do that daily. We're supposed to pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, please give me what I need today. I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to me next year. I don't know where the U.S. economy is going and the stock market and all that. But Lord, give me what I need today. Sustain me today. Lord, I need you today. Lord, I'm dependent upon you, not just throughout the year or throughout the month or throughout the week, but I'm dependent on you every single day. Here, Jesus urging us to understand our dependence on God. Our dependence on God to take care of us and provide for us as we live on his planet. Jesus says we need to pray asking God for our physical needs, but we also need to pray asking God for our spiritual needs. We need to pray asking God, according to verse 12, for forgiveness of our sins or forgiveness of our debts. Notice how Jesus there calls sin a debt. It's called a debt. Why is it called a debt? Well, the reason why it is called a debt is because when we commit it, the result of that is we're not giving God what we owe him, and that's our obedience. That's our love. That's our submission and our devotion. You see, whenever we sin, we don't give God what he is due. We don't give God obedience, and that means we owe God. We owe a debt to God. And one of the conditions for us to receive forgiveness for that debt as Jesus says, we got to forgive our debtors. In verses 14 through 15, he says that we got to forgive those who have debts against us, who sin against us, who are seeking to reconcile with us. Here we learn from Jesus that forgiveness from God is conditional. It's conditional. It is conditioned upon us repenting, as Brother Brian talked about this morning. And seeking the Lord's forgiveness and making sure that we forgive other people and that we don't harbor any grudges. Jesus says we need to pray every day asking God for our daily bread. And we need to ask God to forgive us for our debts as we forgive people who commit debts against us. And we also, he says, need to pray that the Lord will not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. Some of your translations may say deliver us from the evil one. That's the devil. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever deal with that in your life? You ever have moments like that in your life? You ever have moments of temptation? You ever have those moments where you feel weak and feeble and you're just that close to giving in to the temptations and the stumbling blocks that the devil is putting in front of you? Do you ever have those moments in your life I do. I have those moments. I think we all have those moments. And Jesus says we need to pray about that. We need to pray about that ahead of time. In our daily prayers, we need to beg God to please keep us from tempting situations. Please protect us from the evil one. Please watch over us. Because the evil one who is the devil, he's a strong adversary, and we're not always as strong as we should be. 
We're not always as wise and mature as we should be. We have all lost many battles against the devil before in our lives, and we need God to help us. We need God to rescue us. We need God to provide a way of escape for us. We need God at times to providentially keep us from being taken advantage of by him. That's what Jesus says in the model prayer. But here's the final question I want us to think about this morning. And that is, how should we be challenged? How are you challenged? How am I challenged? How are we all challenged by this model prayer? Well, I want to give you three things very quickly. Three ways that I believe this prayer challenges us. First, this prayer challenges us to be more spiritually focused in our prayers. More spiritually focused. And I'm going to tell y'all something. For me personally, I'm just talking about me, I have not always had those kind of prayers. I have failed when it comes to having those kind of prayers. You know what my prayers are a lot of times? My prayers are all about things physical. They're all about going through a sick list and asking God to heal people physically. They're lopsided. They're all about physical healings and God tending to the physical needs of the people that I love. And while there's nothing wrong with praying for those kinds of things, I want to be clear. Let me suggest that from this prayer, Jesus challenges us to have some balance. To have spiritually focused prayers as well. In fact, it is interesting how out of all the things Jesus mentions... And Matthew chapter 6, out of all the things he mentions in that prayer, only one of those things is physical. Only one. And it's what you find in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Everything else is spiritual. Everything else is spiritual. Our Father who's in heaven, that's spiritual. Hallowed be your name, that's spiritual. Forgive us of our sins, that's spiritual. Don't lead us into temptation, that's spiritual. Protect us from the evil one who's the devil, that's spiritual. This prayer is loaded. With spiritual ideas and spiritual concepts and spiritual requests, and I need to load my prayers up like that. That's how I need to pray. I need to challenge myself from here on to load my prayers with spiritual things. To put on my spiritual thinking cap whenever I pray. To pray for things like the growth of God's spiritual kingdom. And the forgiveness of my spiritual debts and my own spiritual maturity and my own spiritual growth and help against my spiritual enemy, who is the devil. But far too often, I'm more focused on the physical when I pray than the spiritual. And Jesus says, I got to do better. I got to have more spiritually focused prayers and I also got to have more God centered prayers. And again, I fail here. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. I fail so often when it comes to this. So often when I pray, I make my prayers all about me. All about what I want. All about what's on my heart. All about all the different things I want God to do for me. And while there's something wrong, let me be clear, with making requests to God and asking God for blessings, those prayers are called prayers of supplication. There's nothing wrong with that. But from this model prayer, Jesus says, I can do better. I can do better. Jesus in this prayer challenges me to be more thoughtful and conscious of God when I pray. He challenges me to understand that when I pray, who I'm talking to, I'm talking to God. I should acknowledge God's name. I should acknowledge the privilege I have to speak to the creator of the universe. This prayer challenges me to really mean the words that I say when I begin my prayers with the words, my father who's in heaven. I need to really pause, just think about what that means and what a privilege that is. I need to pause for just a moment and realize that, hey, wait a minute, I actually get to talk to God. I can't get through to the Passport Information Center, but I can talk to God anytime I desire. This prayer challenges us to have more spiritually focused prayers and more God-centered prayers. And then let me just close by saying it also challenges us to pray. To just pray. 
to pray all the time. To make time for prayer like Jesus always made time for prayer. To understand that prayer is something that every disciple can do. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how long you've been a disciple. I don't care how much Bible knowledge you have or don't have. If you are a disciple this morning, you need to understand this sermon is for you. You can do this. You can pray. You can talk to God. You can talk to God as your father. You can hollow the name of God. You can pray for spiritual things. You can pray that the gospel is spread and that people are pricked by the gospel and that people will submit to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. You can pray asking God for your daily bread and forgiveness for your debts and that God will deliver you from the assaults of the evil one. You can pray like this. And I can pray like this. And my dear friends, we need to pray like this. We need to pray like Jesus. We need to pray like Jesus taught us to pray. We need to challenge ourselves from here on out to make sure that our prayers are balanced, God-centered, and full of spiritually rich content. That's how Jesus teaches us to pray. And let's strive to pray then in this way. Let's strive to pray like to pray like Jesus. Let's strive to pray like disciples of Jesus. In fact, maybe you sit there this morning, you realize that you're not even a disciple. Maybe you sit there this morning and realize that you can't take advantage of the privilege to being able to call God your father and talk to him through prayer because you've yet to even had your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus the Christ. If that's the case, then we can help you with that this morning. If you're willing to confess your faith in Christ and repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, God will bring you into his kingdom. You will submit to his rule and his reign and you have access to him through prayer or maybe you are a Christian this morning and you're harboring sin. If that's the case, you can repent and ask us to pray with you and pray for you. And God will certainly hear us and keep his promise to forgive you. Whatever spiritual need you may have this morning. Come to the front. Let's stand. Let's sing.